by internet or tuning in by internet radio, we welcome you tonight. Praise the Lord. I'm excited tonight. Amen. The the Lord laid it on my heart today. Amen. For me to believe that people would be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I'm believing it. That people here, that people on internet, that people on internet radio, that people on our phone app will listen to these messages today and be filled with the Holy Spirit where the Lord can take them into a deeper relationship with the Spirit, as the, the man with the nail-scarred hand takes him deeper into the river. Praise the Lord. It's page 1144 of your Expositor Study Bible. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. I'm excited tonight, church. Amen. Amen. Aren't you excited tonight to hear from the Lord? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. I believe that something good is just about ready to happen. I feel like something good is on its way. Amen. He has promised that he'd open all of heaven. And brother, this could be that very day. Hallelujah. If God's people humble and call on Jesus and look to heaven expecting as they pray, I just feel like something good is about to happen. And brother, this could be that very day. Glory to God, church. Another day to serve him and see him work in our lives and through others. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isaiah 28, verse 11. Everybody have it. And it says, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest, wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And we'll stop right there. The purpose of speaking in other tongues. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, for working in hearts and lives and your spirit having his way today. And Father, we just ask that that don't quit, Lord, but the Holy Spirit continue to have his way as we just evidence simple faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord. And Lord, you have given us power with the Holy Spirit for a reason, Lord. Lord, so that signs and wonders may follow confirming the word that the blood of Jesus Christ is the only way. And Lord, we are asking that these signs shall follow, and one of those signs being speaking with other tongues. And we'll give you all the praise, we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen Amen and amen. You may be seated if you care to. Praise the Lord. The Lord himself in the gospel said, these signs shall follow those who believe. And when one gets baptized with the Holy Spirit... The initial physical evidence is that they will speak in another language known on this earth somewhere. And we have to understand when we discern the word truthfully and rightly that there is a difference between those who get filled with the Spirit and speaking in other tongues and the gift of tongues. And I don't want to get into the gift of tongues really tonight, but I want to get on to the initial physical evidence of speaking in other tongues when one gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we see here in Isaiah, there is a great blessing that the Lord gives us when we get baptized with the Holy Spirit and we start speaking in other tongues. The Bible says in Isaiah that it is a rest and a refreshing onto our soul to speak in other tongues. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. I said glory to God. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. I said there is a tremendous blessing here. Of speaking in other tongues. Amen. It is a rest and a refreshing onto our soul. Praise the Lord. 
Now, when we speak in other tongues, we have to understand that tongues do not make our trials and tribulations go away. But what it will do is give a rest and a refreshing as we go through those trials and as we go through those tribulations. It's like a man going through a desert. It doesn't make the desert go away, amen. But what it does is it allows him to stop of what you would think of at an oasis in a desert and get a rest and a refreshing as he continues traveling on. We're just traveling, passing through here. This world is not my home. Amen. And when trials and tribulations come my way, I thank God that I'm able to speak in tongues and have a temporary rest and a refreshing as I evidence faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and allow the power of the Holy Spirit to quicken me. It'll give us a temporary rest and a refreshing onto our soul. And why is that? Amen. Because we see, and I'm going to have you turning in scriptures tonight, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. We see here what that initial physical evidence really is. Everybody have it? It says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. All speaking in other tongues is it's your spirit praying along with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'll say that again. When you start speaking in other tongues, it's your spirit praying along with the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, the Holy Spirit knows how to pray. Amen. Amen. I always tell people, when you don't know how to pray, just start praying in tongues. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit knows how to do it right to begin with. Well, Brother Brad, it also says that if I sing with the Spirit, I will also sing with the understanding. Praise is part of prayer. I said praise is part of prayer. Amen. So when one gets filled with the Holy Spirit, amen, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God gives them a tremendous gift. He gives them a devotional prayer language. Where their spirit prays along with the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? That's all speaking in tongues is. It's praying with the Holy Spirit. Your spirit praying along with the Holy Spirit. And many have asked, well, Brother Brad, I, I, I don't understand what I'm saying. I know it's unfruitful. The Bible says, but it sure does edify us. Amen. Well, Brother Brad, what am I saying? Well, in Acts 2.11, we get the answer. In Acts chapter 2, verse 11, we get to see what we're praying when we pray in tongues. Everybody have it? Acts chapter 2, verse 11. It says, and this is on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and they all started speaking in other tongues. It says in verse 11, it says, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. We are praying and uh, praising in the wonderful works of God. Amen. We don't know what we're saying. It may seem unfruitful, but it is sure edifying because when we're praying in the Spirit, you may be saying, Lord, thank you for the blood. Lord, thank you that he didn't come down off that cross. Lord, thank you for putting him in the tomb. Lord, thank you for him raising three days later. Lord, thank you for sending back the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for giving us the gifts of the Spirit to operate within us. Lord, thank you. We don't know what we're saying, but we do know we are saying the wonderful works of God. It is a devotional prayer language. Praising and worshiping the Lord in other tongues. The wonderful works of God. 
That's why when one starts speaking in other tongues, amen, they start sensing the presence of the Lord because what they're really doing is praise and worship. And the Bible says to enter in his gates with thanksgiving and praise. And what does thanksgiving and praise and worship do? It ushers in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So wouldn't it make sense tonight when you start praising him and worshiping him and getting in your prayer closet and start speaking in other tongues, you're ushering in the presence of the Lord. And when you start ushering in the presence of the Lord, the peace of God which surpasses all your understanding and in your mind and in your heart, Philippians, will come upon you, giving you a temporary rest and refreshing as you go through trials and tribulations. Now, doesn't that just sound wonderful? I said, doesn't that just sound like a blessing? Amen. Being able to usher in the presence. You don't have to wait till Sunday morning, amen, to sense the presence of the Lord. You can be baptized in the Holy Ghost and the Lord will give you your own devotional prayer language. Speaking in other tongues. Praying your spirit, praying along with the Holy Spirit. In praise and worship, magnifying the wonderful works of God, ushering in the presence of the Lord. With the peace of God coming upon you, surpassing all your understanding in your mind and in your heart. And you get a rest and a refreshing in your soul and in your spirit as you go through trials and tribulations. That was the purpose of God giving his children the blessing of being able to speak in other tongues. Amen? Now, who wouldn't want that? I said, I don't understand. Why wouldn't a believer want that? Why wouldn't you want something for God that could give you a rest and a refreshing and usher in the presence of God when you're going through trials and tribulations? Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Let's not misunderstand, folks. There is no power in tongues. The power is in the Holy Spirit. And all tongues is, is praise and worship unto the Lord as our spirit prays along with the Holy Spirit. Because we also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Everybody have it? It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, talking about speaking in other tongues, it says, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Okay? So we see from this scripture that there's no power in tongues. All it is is praise and prayer to usher in the presence of the Lord. And if our motives aren't correct, tongues ain't going to do us no good. Amen? Do you understand that? It'll just be like a tinkling cymbal or sounding brass because the power is not in tongues the power is in the holy spirit as we love the lord for who he is and what he's done at calvary's cross and when we love him for who he is and what he's done guess what faith which works by love it's going to energize our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we are loving him for who he is and what he's done, and our faith getting energized, amen, placing our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, we have a tremendous blessing where we're able to speak in other tongues and usher in the presence of the Lord and get a temporary refreshing and rest as we go through trials and tribulations. So we see here there is no power in tongues according to Acts 13.1 because all it is is a prayer language. Praise and worship, amen. But if we're loving him for who he is and what he's done, amen, energizing our faith in the blood of Jesus, we can see that tongues can be such a tremendous blessing being able to usher in the presence of the Lord. And there are many blessings of speaking in other tongues, Amen. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm going to keep you in 1 Corinthians for most of the night tonight. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. It says, For he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him how a bit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Let me read that again. This is one of the greatest blessings we could have of speaking in other tongues. For he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him how a bit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. When you start speaking in other tongues, you're speaking directly to the Lord. Amen. I said, you're speaking directly to the Lord. I said, you're speaking directly. You're not speaking to men. You're speaking to God. You're speaking to the one who said, let there be light. And there was light. Amen. You're speaking to the one who put all the stars in the heavens. What a blessing to be able to speak in other tongues. Speaking directly, not to men, but on to God. If we go on in verse 4 here in the same chapter, it says, He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Speaking in other tongues edifies us. Amen. It builds up our faith. And Christ and what he's done at the cross. How do you know that? Because when I'm going through trials and I'm going through tribulations, amen, I can get in my prayer closet and speak in other tongues, usher in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, the peace of God coming upon me, surpassing all my understanding in my mind and in my heart. And I have the knowing that he has not left me nor forsake me, building my faith that he's still with me. Edifying my faith edifies me, knowing he hasn't left, Amen. that he's not gone, that he, what his word says, saying, I shall never leave you nor forsake you, Amen. speaking in other tongues, him knowing that he is right there, right along with me, it edifies you. I said, it edifies you. It edifies you. And there's many times where it feels like we're out in the spiritual desert and we don't know where God is. Lord, where have you gone? Where are you? Lord, do you see I'm going through these trials? Lord, do you see I'm going through these tribulations? Lord, do you see what the devil's trying to do in my life? Lord, have you seen where are you? But I'm able to start speaking in other tongues. And no, he's right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. That greater who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Edifies me. Knowing he hasn't left me nor forsaken me. But the Holy Spirit still abides in me and upon me. And I can pray in my spirit right along with the Holy Spirit. No matter what the situation is. No matter where I'm at in the world. No matter what friends or family members may have forsaken me. Amen. But that there is one who was forsaken on the cross. So I would never be forsaken. It edifies me. I said it edifies me. I said it edifies me. And as I've already stated, it gives us a rest and a refreshing onto our soul going through trials and tribulations. Again, it doesn't make the trials and tribulations go away, but what it does do gives us a rest and a refreshing, amen, ushering in the presence of the Lord as we get into our prayer closet, praying in the Spirit, amen, edifying us, knowing that no matter either while we're going through a trial, that He is still there and that He will not leave me nor forsake me. It also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, same chapter, go down to verse 22. Everybody have it. It says, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them who believe, 
but to them who believe not. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them who believe, but to them who believe not. Speaking in other tongues is a sign to the world that Jesus is coming. It's a sign, listen to that, it's a sign to the world. (laughs) Jesus is coming. It's a sign to the world that us believers are about ready to go home. I said it's a sign to the world that Jesus is coming. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this is that what the prophet Joel had prophesied, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your servants and your handmaidens shall prophesy. It is a sign to the world that we're in the last days and Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. See, to them who believe, they have the Holy Spirit and they bear witness. So they don't need to hear tongues to know that Jesus is coming. But to those who don't believe who don't have the Holy Spirit abiding in them, when they hear somebody speak in tongues, it's a sign to them that what the Word of God says is real and true and that we are in the last days and this thing is wrapping up quickly and Jesus is coming. Praise the Lord. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. He's coming. He's coming. You hear somebody speak in tongues. It's a sign to anybody who listens to this service who doesn't believe that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. If that don't get you excited that Jesus is coming, I don't know what will. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to be to heaven, amen. I'm ready to be with the master, be with the Lord. I want to go home. Yes, I know. There are those out there still lost, amen. And while my spirit wants to go home, My soul and spirit want to go home with the Lord. I know, as Paul said, it's better for me to be here. Amen. But that still doesn't mean that my spirit and soul isn't longing to go home. Amen. I don't know about you. Yes, my flesh does not want to die. Amen. This flesh does not want to be buried in the ground. But my soul and spirit, amen, there's still an urgency in my soul and spirit saying, Lord, take me. I want to go home. I want to be with you, Lord. Amen. Amen. It's a sign to the unbelievers that we're living in the last days, that this thing is wrapping up very quickly. Amen. And that the Lord Jesus is coming back. I said that the Lord Jesus is coming back. Amen. And we've seen that in the last church age here, the Laodicean church, they're a lukewarm church, and they're really not worried about the things of God, and they're content where they're at. And why is that? Because they don't believe Jesus is coming. I said, they don't believe Jesus is coming. Amen. That's why you got to get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen. With the initial physical evidence. Amen. So you can have power to take that message out to him, Christ and him crucified. Amen. And when they see the initial physical evidence of people speaking in other tongues, it will be a sign unto them. And they will know that Jesus Christ is coming. It is a sign to unbelievers that we are in the last days. Many will ask, well, Brother Brad, does that just mean we go running around speaking tongues everywhere and never talk a bit of English? No, Paul did address it in Corinthians, amen, that 
Just as everything else, we have to put speaking in tongues in its proper place. Amen? And so, there are six times when one should refrain from speaking in other tongues, according to the Word of God. First of all, and we're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says in verse 19, Yet in the church... I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So first of all, when it comes to the preaching of the word, there's nothing wrong with a preacher when he starts feeling the presence of the Lord and gets a bit excited and may say a few words in tongues. I don't see nothing wrong with that. But when his whole church service... His whole preaching is nothing but just speaking in other tongues. Then nobody's going to get edified. The preacher may get edified, but the people will not because they won't understand what he's saying. So when it comes to the preached word, if I was standing behind this pulpit after we got done with worship service, amen, and just started speaking in tongues for the next 45 minutes to an hour, none of you are going to understand what I'm saying, and none of you are going to get edified, and your faith will not be built up on Christ and Him crucified. Build my faith, because I'm the one speaking, it edifies me, but it's not going to edify anybody else. So when it comes to the preached word, the preacher, it's better for the preacher, amen, to preach his natural language so the people may get edified. Amen, that's why you come to church, is to hear the preached word so you may get edified, so your faith may get built up, so you can take it outside these four walls and let your light shine. So you may receive instruction of the word. And if I'm just speaking in tongues all night long here during church service, you ain't going to get nothing out of it. So first of all, we have to understand when it comes to somebody preaching the word, they need to speak in their natural language, preaching the word, so people can understand what they're saying. And again, that doesn't mean when the preacher gets excited or gets the anointing of the Holy Spirit falls upon him, he wants to speak in tongues for a second. And just give him glory for a second. Amen. I don't see nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to the whole preaching, we need to stay in our natural language and try to edify the people. You're not here to bless me. I'm here to be a blessing to you. That's what the preacher's supposed to be. You're not supposed to bless the preacher. The preacher's supposed to be a blessing to the body. Edifying the body. Instructing the body. And Christ and him crucified. Amen. So when it comes to the preached word, He says, yet in the church, talking about when it's time to preach the word, I had rather speak five words with my understanding, talking about our natural language, than by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Secondly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16, it says, else when you shall bless with the Spirit, how shall he who occupies the room of the unlearned Say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what you say. This is talking about saying grace at meal times. Amen. Those who are unlearned, if you try to pray over the food or the meal for supper, lunch, breakfast, whatever meal it is, and those who are unlearned are sitting around the dinner table and you start speaking in tongues, how are they able to say amen to that because they don't know what you're saying? The word amen means truth or true. You can't say something is true and right if you don't understand what they're saying. So when it comes to meals at the table and saying grace over the food, we are to speak in our natural language so everybody around the dinner table or wherever we're at is understanding what you're saying and they may say amen to that prayer. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23, it says, If there be, therefore, the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) What's Apostle Paul saying here? He's saying if there's new converts that come through the door and the whole congregation does nothing for the whole church service 
through worship, through the givings and offerings, and, and through the preached word, and through the altar call at the end, is nothing but just speaking in other tongues, the whole body doing it. And those who are unlearned or new converts come in who don't know anything about it, they're going to come in here and say, you all are crazy. <laughs> I don't know what you've been drinking, but I don't understand what's going on here. Now, again, this does not mean that we cannot sing and praise the Lord in tongues when it comes to the worship part of the service. Amen. When it comes to the worship part of the service, when we're singing songs and praising the Lord, amen, it's okay for us to praise Him in English. It's okay for us to praise Him in the Spirit, speaking in other tongues. It's okay to sing in English. It's okay to sing in the Spirit and sing in tongues. Amen. But when it comes to just the whole church doing nothing and our focus is nothing on but just speaking in other tongues and it takes over the entire service to where new converts or unbelievers may come in, they're just going to say, you're crazy and we don't know what's going on and they're going to leave. And we don't want them to leave. We want them to receive the truth of Christ and Him crucified. Again, there is nothing wrong with getting excited when the Spirit hits you during the worship part, amen, and praising Him in English and praising Him in tongues, amen. But we just can't sit around all church service during the preaching and during everything and the whole body just speaking in tongues and new converts going away, not edified. Amen. Oh, there are times where the Lord takes over the service to where it's nothing than but just a time of prayer and praise and and we do nothing but just worship the Lord and at times the Holy Spirit's going to lead us to do that and we've had that happen before where we've had everybody come up to the altar amen and the whole service was nothing but worship and praise as we praised him in English and praised him in tongues and sang in English and sang in tongues and the presence of the Lord moved mightily but there are going to be some services where the Lord doesn't do that, amen, because he sends in new converts wanting to learn the message of the cross, amen. And they're going to have to hear us speak in English as well so that we can edify them, amen. Do you understand that? So when it comes to new converts coming in, it's okay to sing and praise him in tongues during the worship service, but at the same time, Amen. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and know when He tells us in our spirit to say, that's enough. Amen. Do you understand that? Do you get that? And that's one time when we need to refrain. Doesn't mean we can't speak in tongues during the worship service. Amen. But we have to learn for the Holy Spirit when He tells us, you need to stop right there. Amen. Amen. So the new converts and those who are unbelievers who come in can get edified and learn this message. We see also in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 30 to 33. It says, if anything be revealed to another who sits by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the pro prophets. For God is not the author of confusion as in all churches of the saints. At times the Lord is going to move on you to be used in the gifts of the spirit. Amen. Amen. And you may, during the preached word, have the power of the Holy Spirit hit you. Amen. But God is not going to interrupt himself. Amen. So in other words, we are to refrain from speaking in other tongues when the word of God is being preached. 
Amen. And one token, the preacher shouldn't be just speaking in all tongues because nobody's going to get edified. And at the same time, when the Lord's anointing the minister to preach, whether it be the pastor or the evangelist, we have to refrain at times, amen, of speaking in other tongues so people can hear the word being preached. Amen. That doesn't mean when they get a revelation or something, amen, and the church starts clapping and says hallelujah and says glory to God. Nothing wrong with that. Amen. But there is something wrong if the minister is preaching and then all of a sudden in the middle of the service somebody gets up and just starts shouting and praising and interrupts the preached word. Amen. Do you understand that? Again, there is nothing wrong, amen, when the Spirit starts moving as the Word's being preached, amen, and people start saying, hallelujah, amen, and people start clapping their hands because there's good revelation, or there's a pause when the uh, preacher is preaching, but just to interrupt him and interrupt the whole service to where confusion is being brought about, that's not of the Lord, amen. And so during the preach preaching of the word we need to refrain from not interrupting the preacher preaching amen again I don't want to people fear amen when you sense the presence of the Lord and there's a pause during the preaching where people are clapping and praising because the Lord is moving and touching hearts and touch lives it's okay to say hallelujah it's okay to say glory it's okay to say a few words and tongues and praise His holy name, but we don't want to continue and just interrupt the whole service to where people cannot get edified and it brings confusion. Does that make sense? And then there's two more reasons, but this does not deal with our devotional prayer languages of tongues. It deals with the gift of tongues. Every spirit-filled believer will get a devotional language of speaking in other tongues. But there will be a select few in the body who God will use to give a tongue to the whole body for a message that's supposed to be interpreted. And we've all heard that before in this church. Amen? So can you tell the difference? I know I'm not speaking to the people on camera right now, but I'm speaking to the body that's here in this local congregation. We know what the difference is. Amen. A spirit-filled believer who receives the initial physical evidence, they have their own devotional prayer language. Amen. When they can start speaking in tongues whenever they want, and they can stop speaking in tongues whenever they want. And there will be a, a few select people, amen, who God will use in the gift of tongues where he will select a few individuals and he will move upon them at the right moment, not bringing in confusion, but at the right moment when the preacher has stopped his preaching or when the worship singers have, may have stopped their worshiping for a few minutes in between songs where there is a time where that person who is being led of the Spirit is able to speak in other tongues and give a message to present to the whole body that is to be interpreted in the natural language. Amen. And when it comes to that gift of tongues, giving a message to the entire body, not just your devotional prayer language because of being spirit filled, but the nine gifts of the spirit where somebody gives a tongue to be interpreted for the entire body, we need to refrain when there has already been two or three messages already given. Amen. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 27. It says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most, by three. And that by course, and let one interpret. Do you understand that? The Holy Spirit is not going to move on every single person in the congregation and give a tongue to where we have 12 messages. Amen. The Holy Spirit will move on a few select people who he, who he wills to give that gift. And by two or three messages the most is all we're supposed to give. Amen. And also we have to understand when it comes to the gift of tongues. In verse 28 of the same chapter it says, But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So we see here, if you are in a church and you don't know if there is an interpreter, 
who has the gift of interpretation to interpret that language. You haven't um, seen them been used in the interpretation or you may have seen somebody used in that gift but they're not present in the church service. Then we are to keep silent and just speak in tongues to ourselves onto God. Does that make sense? For example, let me say this. Let's say Sister Cherry and Sister Michelle was up here leading worship. Amen. And say, Brother Joe was the one that had the gift of interpretation. He was the only one that we knew of that had it. And the singers are worshiping the Lord, and the presence of the Lord is being ushered in, and he's moving in hearts and lives. Amen. But Brother Joe was not there that service. Amen. And then Sister Ruth, who may have the gift of tongues, senses his presence. Amen. And senses like she should give a, a tongues and message to the entire body. But if she knows that Brother Joe is not there and she knows that nobody else has been used in that gift, well, then she needs to keep silent and just pray in tongues onto herself because it'll bring confusion because what she'll do is she'll speak, and I'm just not singling out Sister Ruth, okay? Just using examples here, folks. So if she speaks in tongues knowing there's no interpreter, it's going to bring confusion because everybody's going to wait for interpretation and we're not going to get one. And the singers are going to say, well, okay, what do we do now? They may look at the pastor, and the pastor may say, well, praise the Lord, um, keep on going. And, but do you understand that? And there is a time, yes, where people can sense and pray that there's an interpreter in the church service, and maybe the Lord is trying to get them to step out, amen, into that gift. Amen, so... and. I've been used in the gift of tongues and I've been used in the gift of interpretation. And so don't be afraid to step out in those callings that God has given you. Amen. If you've seen people interpret before, amen, step out and trust God with it. Amen. Don't let the devil lie to you and say nobody's going to interpret. I better keep silent. No, if you know that there's interpreters there who've been used in this gift, amen, And I've seen people start to be used in the gifts of the Spirit as they have come in and seen the gifts operate, knowing who has the gift of tongues, who has the gift of interpretation, and not being afraid to step out in that calling. Amen. But when we know that we know that we know that there is no interpreter that has the gift of interpretation, we need to keep silent and just speak in tongues onto ourselves, onto God. Amen. Does that make sense? Am I not confusing anybody? Amen? So there are times that we need to refrain from speaking in tongues, whether it deals with our devotional prayer language. Amen? Our own devotional prayer language that each spirit-filled believer receives, like um, during the preached word, or the preacher when it comes to preaching, or saying grace on a meal. We need to refrain from speaking in tongues during those times. Or when it comes to the gift of tongues where somebody is used to give it to the entire body, knowing that there's no interpreter, they need to keep silent and just speak in tongues onto themselves, their devotional prayer language speaking onto God, knowing that there's no interpreter. Or if two or three messages has already been given to the body and been interpreted. Amen. But tongues can be a tremendous blessing in our walk. The cross has paid for it. Amen. I said the cross has paid for it. And we should not shy away from it or be ashamed of it. Amen. God has given it to us as a blessing and for a reason. To give a rest and a refreshing on to his believers. And to be a sign to the unbelievers that Jesus is coming. And there will be people that may argue with you. And there are four different times... Uh, Four different scenarios people will argue with you. First of all, I've heard the argument where people have said, well, that's not, speaking in tongues is not a prayer language. It was just given on to the apostles um, to speak different languages to, so they could go preach it to other lands. That's not true. That's not true. God did not just give it to the apostles to be able to go out to other nations and speak other languages so they could preach. To them. How do you know that? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 2, it says, 
for he who speaks in an unknown tongue, now listen, speaks not unto men. God did not give tongues to speak or preach to other men. But it says, but on to God. He gave tongues, the speaking in other tongues, not to be able to preach to other nations in their language, but he gave it to believers for a devotional prayer language. Because it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, amen, that if anyone speak in an unknown tongue, he speaks not on to men. It wasn't given to preach to other nations in in their language. But it was given to us so we could pray in a devotional prayer language, our spirit praying along with the Holy Spirit, on to God. Amen. 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 It says right there, black and white. People can argue with me all they want, saying it wasn't a devotional prayer language and that it was given to only the apostles to go out to other lands and speak those languages so they could preach to them. That's not true, because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, for he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men. It wasn't given for the apostles to go out in other lands and speak their languages to preach to them. Because it says here in the Bible, it, they're not speaking on to men, but they are speaking on to God. The second thing we may, people may say, it's, well, it's not for today. After the Bible was written, the canon of scripture was closed and then tongues was done away with and knowledge has vanished. Really? Because I've seen knowledge increase in the last days. Daniel said that knowledge should and in, will increase in the last days. And we've seen knowledge increase. We've seen knowledge increase spiritually where people have been given the revelation of the cross as for sanctification. And we've seen knowledge increase physically. We have planes. We have cars. We have trains. We have phones which used to have to have a landline where you rotored around and had to talk to an operator and say, please collect, uh, connect me to 2222. Amen. To where now we have knowledge increase to where we can just have a cell phone and all I got to do is dial a few buttons and not even have a physical line and just speak in it. But in 1 Corinthians, I'll get to the scripture that they use and I'm, I'm almost done church. I'm wrapping up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 8, this is the scripture they use. It says, love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And many misinterpret this scripture saying, well, when the canon of scripture was written, all this stuff was done away with. That's not what that's talking about. Amen. It doesn't say when that perfect day is written about. It says, when that perfect day is come. Tongues will cease. Amen. And knowledge will vanish away after the rapture of the church happens. And why is that? Because we'll go home to be with the Lord. And guess what? There'll be no praying over there because we'll be with him. And there'll be no need to speak in tongues because tongues is a prayer language. And if there's no praying over there... Because we're with the Lord now. There'll be no need to speak in tongues. Amen. So this is concerning after the rapture of the church or when we go by the graveside to go home to be with the Lord. We'll no longer be, have to speak in tongues after that. Amen. Why is it? Because there's no praying over there. Amen. Because I'll be with the Lord. I won't have to pray. I can go to him because I will be with him. So there'll be no need to speak in tongues over there in heaven. Amen? So no, it is misinterpreted when people say it was only for the first generation. No, it's not. It's still for today. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that it was only for the first generation. They can try to point to this scripture, but it does not say when the perfect day is written about. It says when the perfect day is come. And I don't know about you, but I'm still here. Amen? And if I miss the rapture, we're all in big trouble. So it's talking about that perfect day when the rapture comes and we go home to be with the Lord. Then will tongues be done away with.
because there'll be no praying over there. There'll be no sickness over there. There'll be no aging over there. Amen. We will be with him. Some say it's just babble. All they're saying is blah, 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 blah. Amen. We've all heard that. Come on, we go out in the world. We've got jobs. We've got unsaved friends. We've got unsaved neighbors. We've got, we've got some unsaved religious folk saying you're just babbling. Well, they said that in the Bible too. What do you mean? Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 13. Everybody there? Well, as you're turning, I'll tell you, this is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the 120, and as the 120 are baptized with the Holy Ghost, they all start speaking in tongues. And you have to remember, there's a million plus Jews in Jerusalem, and the temple is packed full of people going in and out and here are 120 in the Gentile court and they start all speaking in other tongues and there were some there in the Gentile court mocking saying it was just babble because in verse 13 it says others mocking said these men are full of new wine in other words people were mocking them who were speaking in tongues saying they're drunk with alcohol they're babbling over there But look what the next verse says. But Peter, but Peter, after they started mocking and saying, they're babbling over there. They're drunk with alcohol. They're crazy. Peter stands up in the mist and lifts up his voice at him and says, this is that that Joel had prophesied, that in the last days he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. It is not babble. It is not people being drunk with alcohol, seeing that it is only three, 9 o'clock in the afternoon. But this is that that Joel prophesied. In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And these signs shall follow those who believe. They shall speak in new tongues. It is not babble. Your lips may stammer, but there will be words and phrases that flow out of that stammering. And he will flow out of you like a river. And living water shall issue out of your innermost being. It's not babble. People will mock you. People will make fun of you saying, you're drunk. You just saying, this is, you just tell them, this is that that Joel prophesied. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's not Babel. And finally, some may say, well, not all speak in tongues. There's some who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit because they felt something or they felt his presence and they know they got filled, but they didn't speak in tongues. I'm sorry, you didn't get filled. I thank God that you felt his presence, but you did not get filled. Amen. I'll say that again. I thank God that you felt his presence. And if you would have just opened your mouth and yielded your tongue, he would have filled you. But if you didn't, you're not filled. How do you know that? Well, let me show you the word. Because there may be many on the internet that will argue with that. So let's go to the word. First of all, let's go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 13. Verse 1. Everybody have it? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. It says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. What Paul was saying was, in order to make something biblical doctrine, you have to see it two or three times happen in the Bible to call it biblical. 
In other words, that's why we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That he died, was buried, and rose three days later. Four witnesses. So there's no doubt that he is the Messiah. Matthew saw it. Mark wrote about it uh, through the eyes of Peter. Luke saw it. And John the Beloved saw and wrote about it. We got four witnesses. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He died on the cross. He rose three days later. And he ascended into heaven and told him to wait in Jerusalem. And I'll send back the Holy Spirit. Three or more witnesses. It's biblical. Jesus is the Savior. He died for your sins. It's biblical. Four witnesses wrote about it. Okay? In the book of Acts... There is five accounts of people being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Five times we see people baptized in the Holy Ghost. Okay? I need two or three witnesses to make it biblical saying every single person will speak in tongues. And for those who say I don't need to speak in tongues and I'm baptized, you need two or three witnesses to prove to me that you don't need tongues in the Bible. So let's go through those five accounts. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. Acts chapter 2 verse 4 on the day of Pentecost it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. That's one. Okay, that's one. Acts chapter 8. Verses 14 to 21. Philip the evangelist goes to the city of Samaria. He goes and preaches the word and many get saved. They accept the word of God. In other words, they get born again, they get saved. And then he calls on Peter and John to come down and lay hands on them and they get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Okay, and starting in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 15, it says, Who when they came down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had, was not fallen upon none of them. And only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Talking about water baptism. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, it doesn't say anywhere in there about speaking in other tongues, right? But let's go on. It says, and when Simon saw, talking about Simon the sorcerer, when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Okay, so first of all, we see here that Simon saw something when they laid hands on him and, get, and got filled with the Holy Ghost and offered him money. There had to be some kind of initial physical evidence happen when Peter and John laid hands on the believers and say, receive the Holy Spirit. Because Simon the sorcerer who was dabbling in black magic over here and the powers of darkness gives his heart and life to Christ and then comes over and sees Peter and John lay hands and it says he saw something. Doesn't say what he saw, but he saw something. There was some kind of initial physical evidence that had happened. I deduct it was speaking in other tongues, but some may say, well, that's, that wasn't it. So I won't use that one. I still need... Another two or three more, okay? So we'll put it on the other score side here. One and one. They did see something, but I can't say they spoke in tongues, even though that's what I believe it was. Because people can argue and say, well, show me in the Word. doesn't say it. So we've got one and we've got one, okay? Acts chapter 9. Verses 17 and 18. The Apostle Paul's conversion. It says, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, who appeared unto you in the way as you come, has sent me that you might receive your spirit and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes, it had been scales, and he received sight forth and arose and was baptized. Okay, he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, some may be on internet right now shouting, say, Aha, it didn't say speak in tongues, I got two. No, you don't. Why is that? Because while it doesn't say here when he got 
baptized in the Holy Ghost that he speak, spoke in tongues. It does say in Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14. Paul writes to the church of Corinth. Verse 18. Look what it says. This is the Apostle Paul writing. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18. It says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. So people could say, well, it doesn't say that the Apostle Paul spoke in tongues when he got baptized. Yes, he did. How do you know? Because in his letter to the church of Corinth, he says, I thank God, I speak in tongues more than you all. I've got scripture to say he spoke in tongues. Because in his letters, he writes back and says, I speak in tongues more than you all. Two to one. Okay, we've, we've still got three more, or two more incidences. Acts chapter 10. Verses 44 to 48, Peter goes over to the Gentiles' house of Cornelius, and he starts preaching about Jesus Christ as the Messiah, amen, and in verse 44 of Acts 10, it says, while Peter yet spoke these words, talking about Christ, they crucified him, buried him, he was raised three days later, it says, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision, talking about the Jews, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Amen. That's three. The last one. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. The apostle Paul comes into the church of Ephesus, and there are some disciples of John who had learned under John the Baptist. And the Apostle Paul comes up to him in chapter 19 of Acts, verse 1. Or I should say starting in verse 2. And it says, have you, and he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Talking about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, Unto then what were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's re, uh, baptism. Talking about the baptism of repentance, getting saved. And then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Then they heard this. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. I have four out of the five that says when they got filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. And I've got the other one out of the five that saw a physical evidence of something happen after they had laid hands on them. And so I have enough biblical witnesses to say that when somebody gets filled with the Holy Ghost, they will speak in tongues. And anybody that says, well, I got filled and I didn't speak in tongues. You didn't get filled. And if you believe that, you are on unscriptural ground. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and also in Deuteronomy chapter 19 says, you have to have two or three witnesses to make anything biblical doctrine. So to say that you got baptized in the Holy Ghost and didn't speak in tongues is unscriptural. You're not fighting me. You're fighting God's word. You have to have two or three witnesses. You have to show me not two or three scriptures, two or three witnesses of it happening. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you cannot call it scriptural doctrine. That's why we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So there is no doubt that Jesus is the Messiah. He died on the cross. He was buried. Three days later, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and poured out the Holy Spirit. And that's why we have five accounts in the book of Acts of people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. With four showing that they spoke in other tongues and the fifth showing that there was an initial physical evidence signifying that when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. And the whole purpose of it is to give you a devotional prayer language. 
your spirit praying along with the Holy Spirit, edifying you, amen, giving you a rest and a refreshing onto your soul, being a sign to the unbelievers that Jesus is coming, being able to speak directly to God. That is the purpose of speaking in other tongues. And any believer can have it if they'll open their mouth, yield their tongue, and let God fill them because Christ paid for it. Amen? Amen. Would you stand? The purpose of tongues. It is to be a blessing onto the believer. And if you've been saved and bought by the price, you are a candidate to get filled. All you have to do is get self out of the way. You on camera, all you got to do is get self out of the way. Yield the tongue and speak what you sense. He's not going to take over you. Amen. He will give you the unction, and by faith you speak it. Your lips will stammer, but just let it flow out, and you will find it to be a blessing onto your soul, giving you a rest and a refreshing as you go through trials and tribulations. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, Lord, that those who hear this message, Lord, that it edify them and let them know and give them a zealousness, Lord, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And all they have to do is, by faith, ask the Lord to give it to them and believe that he will. And to them, open their mouth and yield their tongue and let them speak what they sense and to be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive power. And we'll give you all the praise and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless all of you and we'll see you next service. Amen.